there's just so many different colors out here. You know, everything from yellow and orange and red to green, so many different hues of green, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. Plants are crazy. And when you sit back and think about it, we have them to thank for basically everything in life. Every breath of air that we breathe comes from them and their ability to convert carbon dioxide into oxygen through photosynthesis. Our climate is regulated by them and their ability to transpire water into the atmosphere, which creates different pressure gradients and weather systems. And even every bite of food we eat comes from them in one way or another, as we're either eating plants directly or we're eating things that ate the plants. They're an incredibly important piece of the puzzle of life we have here on this planet, and they come in so many different shapes and sizes. Everything from, you know, these tiny little mosses here to shrubs and ferns and even big leaf maple trees like this feller here. Now all of these different species fall into two main categories of plants, either vascular plants or non-vascular plants, and their origins start back millions of years ago. It's a long story, but I'll make it quick. Ish. Now to start, vascular is a term that refers to something having vessels or means of transporting things within itself. Think of your cardiovascular system here, cardio meaning heart. Your blood veins are basically the vascular system to your heart, transporting blood all throughout your body. With this in mind, we can think of non-vascular plants as plants that photosynthesize, but don't have any tubes, veins, or vessels, or any means of transporting things directly throughout itself, whereas vascular plants do have that ability. It's pretty wild. Thanks to the air, buddy! Non-vascular plants are some of the oldest forms of life on this planet, and as a result, they're incredibly simple. Life began about 3.5 billion years ago in the seas, and most plant life at this time was limited to water-based algaes that could photosynthesize, and are still very common throughout the world today. Think seaweeds here, which are either a form of red, green, or brown algae, although technically brown algae isn't a plant, but that's for a whole other video. At this time in planetary history, the atmosphere was much warmer and rich in carbon dioxide from various tectonic and geological processes taking place, and these early plants were able to take advantage of that bounty of carbon dioxide and photosynthesize a lot and convert it to oxygen. Plant life didn't start colonizing land until about 500 million years ago, and these early plants were incredibly simple as well. Eventually, they began developing more rigid cell wall structures made of cellulose, which gave rise to a whole new form of non-vascular plant known as bryophytes, and this includes mosses, lungworts, and liverworts. As non-vascular plants, water and nutrients tend to move freely between the different cells within the organism, and they can't really control this flow, where it goes, or even store it. So as a result, non-vascular plants tend to be highly dependent on water in order to survive. They need it to photosynthesize by helping move elements and nutrients to and from their chloroplasts, which is how they're going to generate energy and, and grow, and they need it to reproduce by providing a way for the sperm to reach the egg. Now even though they can't control this flow of water, many mosses have actually evolved to take different shapes that help regulate their internal water supply, such as, you know, fanning out when moisture moisture's present so they can absorb more of it, and then as they dry out they kind of curl up which reduces the amount of evaporation, so it's a pretty neat adaptation. All in all, plant life all stems from that first waterborne algae that made it onto land, which just goes to show how important water truly is for all life on this planet. It's pretty awesome. Now, since non-vascular plants lack the ability to regulate water or nutrients within themselves, their size is often limited by their cells' ability to maintain water pressure within themselves, and as a result, they tend to be pretty small, like all these little step mosses here, which get their names because they kind of look like little staircases. But um, it wasn't until about 420 million years ago, when the first vascular plants evolved, that plant life started to really take off on this planet. The first vascular plants to evolve were likely club mosses, horsetails, and ferns, eventually followed by gymnosperms like conifers, like this gorgeous western red cedar here, and angiosperms, or flowering plants like this salal. Now this is characterized by the development of two main types of tissues that help these plants move things around within them, the xylem and the phloem. The xylem allows them to move nutrients and water from their roots up to their leaves, and the phloem allows them to move sugars and organic compounds to wherever the plant needs it most. With the ability to actually control the flow and direction of different nutrients and resources within themselves, as well as you know, their own internal water supply and pressure, this gave plants the ability to develop more rigid cell structures, including hard woody materials that made it possible for them to grow much bigger than those of our previous groupings of mosses and lungworts. For example, these big old Douglas firs around me here, giving rise to the three main parts of plants that we know today, the roots, the trunk or the stem, and the leaves. So, until plants were able to evolve from non-vascular systems to vascular systems, they really lacked the ability to grow with any sort of substantial size, but once they figured this out, they absolutely exploded all over the world. In fact, this period of our planetary history is known for having an abundance of hard woody materials, as well as thick, dense rainforests that covered basically the entire land mass, and this simultaneous influx of, of oxygen into our atmosphere helped spawn the evolution of many different insects and terrestrial animals, which were mostly amphibians at the time 
time with a few different reptiles, but mammals, like us humans, hadn't even evolved yet, which is pretty wild. Ah, that fresh forest air, nothing quite beats it. The amount of plants and vegetation on the planet at this time quite literally changed the entire planet's atmosphere, making it possible for all other forms of life to evolve. I mean, they literally sucked tons of carbon dioxide out of the air, converting it to oxygen through photosynthesis and storing that extra carbon in their woody cell walls. This basically changed the planet from a hot carbon dioxide rich one to a much cooler oxygen rich one, much like the one we inhabit today. I mean, and this all happened way before dinosaurs, before woolly mammoths, before cats and dogs were a thing, before modern humans ever came around. Nobody knows exactly why all these forests died off, although most theories suggest that the shift in the atmosphere triggered an ice age and a subsequent extinction event that wiped out all the plants and animals at the time, leaving them in such vast quantities that this whole period of Earth's history is referred to as the Carboniferous period. Carboniferous is a term in Latin meaning coal bearing, and this is actually where we get most of our coal, oil, and natural gas reserves all around the world. Mind blowing, right? So that same period of Earth's history, that same big boom of plant life that was responsible for changing our planet's atmosphere from this horrible, miserable, inhospitable one into this super cozy, lush environment that we see today, all died off, became fossilized, and that's now what we use to power our modern world as coal, oil, and gas, which is exactly why they're called fossil fuels. When we burn these fossil fuels, we're releasing all that stored up carbon back into the atmosphere, and now it's us humans who are changing the atmosphere from this nice luscious one that we call home into one that's far more inhospitable to all life on this planet. We're now at the brink of an extinction event, and that's kind of scary because extinction is not very chill. Sure. Things have always continued to survive through extinctions events in the past, which is exactly why we still have little non-vascular mosses like this and vascular plants like this huckleberry, this western hemlock, this magnificent western red cedar. But when changes come about that are so sudden and unpredictable, like the ones we're starting to see today, many species all over the planet simply can't adapt or evolve quickly enough and they start to die out. So while us humans might be able to physically survive in a world that's slightly warmer as a result of us burning all these fossil fuels, other species like these western red cedars can't and they're already starting to die out in massive numbers as the effects of climate change become more and more prevalent. So we really need to ask ourselves as a species, what kind of world do we want to live in if we can't grow the food we eat, if we can't get a breath of fresh air, and if everything that we've depended on to live has died out? Unfortunately, unless humans start living within our own ecological systems, we're on track to do just that. We're going to end up killing everything we need to survive, eventually ourselves, and we're going to be extinct. We're on track for extinction. But don't worry, because life on this planet will always go on just as it always has. Whether it be some little vascular plant or maybe just a piece of non-vascular algae floating about in a horribly acidic sea that we've created, life will find a way. We just need to ask ourselves, as a species, if life's something we want to be a part of moving forward, and if so, we need to act accordingly. Oh, gall dang, what a beauty. If you're enjoying these videos, feel free to subscribe to my channel below, or just keep watching to keep learning, because the more you know, the more fun you're going to have next time you're outside in nature, enjoying it. Sure is rad out here. There's just, there's so much green, you know, I've never seen this much green before. <laughs>